entrepreneur, dentist, uh, advisor, and podcast. So my podcast today, I have a special guest, Mr. Brian Kaleo from Dicoma DSO, and he's he's one of the um, most known uh, attorneys in the DSO space. So I wanted to, I've known him for a few years, but I haven't had a chance to really dive into things. We started working with the company recently. I asked him to be a guest. So he said he'd be a guest on my podcast here. So we have him live right now. I know he's he's jumping off of one thing to the next. So I wanted to catch him, ask a few questions. Before I start, though, I was just watching the video about the upcoming event that you guys are having in, um, is, is it Denver in July? And if you could just say, uh, introduce yourself and then tell us about this event. Well, Dr. Lanier, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Brian Kaleo, for those that don't know, the director of Dykema's DSO Industry Group. And I think what you're talking about is our industry-leading event. That's going to be July 10th through the 12th, the Dykema uh, DSO Industry Event. It's um, at the Gaylord Rocky Mountain Resort in Denver, July 10th through the 12th. Last year was our 10th year anniversary. We set an all-time attendance record for a DSO event. We had over 2,000 people. This year, we're shooting for around 2,500 people. Dr. Lanier, I know you and your team are going to be there. And I just look forward to seeing everybody in Denver. The event, you know, we had 41 people there 10 years ago when we started, and now uh, we've got over 2,000. So it's an incredible event. Wow. I look forward to doing that. And um, uh, Brian, you are you're such a rock star in this space. So I'm going to start with some questions I think that could help my group because uh, you you know I have my book, the uh, Entrepreneur yeah. Dentist: How to Exit Your Dental Business Rich. So one of the things that I want to do for any of the people that I'm mentoring out there, and I always think at least going in the younger ones that are starting, you need to go at least for me. I said, well, the ideal thing, once I had an exit, well, what if I went in with the exit in mind? And with that, I'm going to go through a series of questions, but let's keep that in mind that always working with that, how do we do the exits? And I know you guys are here to advise us along the way on all of these things, but I'm going to start with a few questions. Can you tell us about your journey and how you uh, became a prominent figure in this DSO space? Yeah, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, Doc. I mean, I've been here 29 years. This is my 29th year doing it. Not quite as long as you, but a, a long time. And, you know, I got my start in the late 1990s. Um, there was the very first DSO, and um, they didn't do things right. I mean, this is water under the bridge. Obviously, the industry is completely different now. But back in the late 1990s, some of the DSOs weren't following the rules. And I was starting my career, and uh, about 90 orthodontists came uh, to the firm that I was at at the time and said, you got to help us with this. You know, they, we feel like they're, you know, not doing things correctly, not following the rules. It's making us difficult. And, and no one had the term DSO. It was called right. like a practice management company or something back then. And um, we ended up, uh, you know, it was a, a journey, a journey of about four or five years of court proceedings and other things. And that journey on behalf of those 90 some odd orthodontists that ended up, you know, getting everything resolved in a very satisfactory way, sort of made the rules on what, uh, you know, the law says with respect to management agreements, what the DSO is allowed to do, what the DSO is not allowed to do, um, what you have to do to have a compliant organization. You know, there really wasn't a lot of case law. The courts had hadn't even considered this situation. They were like, what is this? You got a dental practice. This is management company. What happens here? You know, the courts were learning. And as a result of literally that five-year journey from about, I don't know, 1997 or 98 to about 2002, when that stuff started to wrap up, that was the beginning. And at the end of that, my phone started to ring off the hook because a lot of investors and a lot of very early stage DSOs, and you would know their names now. They have hundreds and hundreds or thousands of all offices. But back then, they, they were like 20 offices, 15, 20. They right. said, hey, is there a way to do this right? We know all these legal proceedings resulted in court rulings and maybe people weren't doing things correctly, but is there a way to do this? We love dentistry. We love the dental space. We want to invest. We want to create these, at that time, management organizations, but is there a way to do it legally? And I said, yes, there is. You know, these other companies didn't follow those rules, but yes, quite clearly we could. 
And starting in the early 2000s, maybe I got five, then 10, then 15, then 20 um, DSO clients. And now, you know, 29 years later, our group, I mean, first of all, back then it was just me and a couple associates. Now I have 72 professionals on my team and we represent over 700 dental organizations in all 50 states and six Canadian provinces in Europe and Australia and Japan. Wow. You, you guys have grown. I, I do remember uh, that space back then, especially ortho, because a few, like you said, ran in the ditch. And there is because there was a lot of consolidation that was coming together quick and things weren't uh, even back then uh, for me to expand beyond two offices. I had to hire a firm and go through all of the corporate thing to add just a third and a fourth office. Because at that time, it was only allowed to have two doctors, uh, two offices per doctor in the state of California. Yeah, so, that's right. That's right. Because yeah. you, you, of course, started your journey in California, and that had a whole set of specific rules. Still does. I mean, even to this day, California does things the California way, and the rest right. of the country does it you know, a different mm-hmm. way. But, you know, and, and I've learned over the years, one of the things to build within your structure is that legal side, if you're going to do this thing and start to expand, you have to have that whole legal setup. But you guys, as I see now, are doing much, much more than just the the legal side. But I have a question about that later. Uh, So what inspired you to focus on this healthcare regulatory matter? Well, you just pretty much answered it just came to me. No, I mean, it's a great question, Dr. Lanier. I mean, I no one wakes up. The joke I make all the time, sometimes people think it's funny, is I say nobody goes to the, to law school to be the dental guy. Like nobody, like right. when you showed up on your first day of law school, the I'm going to be the dental lawyer. Like nobody does that. And right. I certainly didn't do that. And maybe I thought I was going to be like Perry Mason in court with big trials and running around. But literally the first few weeks on the job, the orthodontist showed up and it was just like... Like that was the card I was dealt and I didn't know quite what to make of it. You know, I didn't, I I said, you know, gosh, I've been working here like two, three months and now I'm all I'm doing is orthodontists all the time. And I didn't know quite what to make of it, but it has been a 29 year journey. But to answer your question, I didn't think about it. It wasn't a plan. That was literally right when I started working there. Next thing I know, the orthodontist walked in the door and that's how it happened. That, you know, and life is like that, you know, and uh, to, to show you, your path was pretty much already laid out. It's just that you have to reach that point to see what it was. At least that's how I process things. Um, so could you share some, some insight into the current landscape of the DSO, MSO, uh, in the dental industry? What, you know, what's it like out there right now? Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky right now out there, um, Dr. Lanier. I mean, the... Um Consolidation is continuing. I know you were part of the first consolidation and now you're back in the game again doing some really exciting things. But, um, you know, um, it's about 31 percent consolidated. There's a lot of runway to go. You know, the next 10 years are probably going to take things from 31 percent to 75 or 80 percent. But it's tricky right now because, you know, interest rates are at all time high. Inflation is at an all time high. The cost of labor is at almost an all time high. So it's slowing it down. I mean, the consolidation has been, you know, right. I would say 2018 was a record year. 2019 was a record year. Uh, the fourth quarter after the whole COVID thing in 2020 was a record quarter. I mean, we couldn't have a record year because we shut down a little bit, but it was crazy. That fourth quarter, 21 was a record year. 22 really? started to recede a little bit because inflation started to come up and uh, 23, you know, giant deals are not quite getting done right now because the environment is not you know, the right environment for maximizing value. Um, A lot of the multiples have come down a little bit on the bigger deals. The cost of borrowing money is more difficult. So we're still seeing, I think, compared to the rest of the economy, dentistry is rocking and rolling is what they would say. But but dentistry compared to dentistry a couple years ago is a little bit of a slowdown. Uh, You know, I feel like a lot's going to depend this year on the outcome of the presidential election. A lot is going to depend on if the interest rates end up coming down and inflation gets under control. And once the interest rates come down a little bit, I think it's going to start exploding again because there's a lot of pent up demand. You know, it reminds me. 
it's nothing compares to COVID where they just shut the whole darn thing down. But it's reminding me a little bit like that because there's a lot of pent up demand of folks that want to do deals, but the conditions are just not quite right for it. And you just get the interest rates down just a little bit and it's going to explode is what I think. You know, I, I look at it from kind of a, um, that same thing, uh, that post COVID lag and, um, and the numbers of course lagged some. So anybody trying to exit right now, the numbers would be down for the post COVID and then coming back, it's going to be a little bit set back, but then, like you said, the interest rates and so forth. But I think all of that is, is we're starting to walk away from it. And just, so I, I think there's some light at the end of the tunnel. I start to see, I, I mean, just for what I'm trying yeah, to Yeah, I mean, do. what's really driving it now, Doc Lanier, is there's a lot of dentists that are in their 60s, maybe older, late, late 50s, and they've been very smart with their money. They've had a great dental practice for the last 25, 30 years. They've done terrific. And now they really just want to go to the golf course or they want to retire and they have this asset. And they're like, you know, when I started this, I never really thought anything would happen with this asset. And now you're telling me I can still get a six or a seven multiple. Maybe a 10 would have been better. But honestly, I'm at the age. I just want to go to the golf course and I'm financially secure anyway. Anyway, so give me a seven. Let's do the deal. Or give me a six. Let's do right, the deal. Right. And there's plenty of those folks. So that's why we're busy. I mean, we've got those. But the entrepreneurs like yourself, when you got started, or those young dentists in their late 30s, early 40s, that they built this thing because they want to maximize value. They want the highest possible return they can get. They're not doing deals right now because the conditions are not supporting those type of deals. I think in the next year or two, it'll come back. But right now, it's you know, if you're a guy and you're 41 years old and you're like, hey, I put these 15 offices together because I want to maximize my return. You got to wait a year or two. That's not going to yeah. happen. If you're and 65 and you want to sell and just, you know, go to the golf course, plenty of deals for you to do that. It's just not maximum value. Yeah. I, I, you know, I grew up on a farm, so I know it's not always time to go to market. You know, it's, uh, it's sometimes it's, it's time to build your product and getting things ready for the market. And that's why I always try to talk about preparation because there's there's a time, like you said, that, that'll be a better time maybe for the market. But then you have to talk about growing the platform. And I like those things of getting people together with resources and so forth to grow the platform. And that's the, the thing I see where a lot of us, we wait too late to spend the money on the legal side and we have these uh, kind of problems. I think one is structure and, and setting up the right kind of structure initially. But then I also see a lot of times when we have um, uh, different compliance and so forth, it, it, all of those things have to be taken into account. So having those kind of advisors there early on as we're moving and building our platform to get ready to exit, I think are important. So I'm trying to, uh, and, and I have a question about my structure and where to put legal as far as under my, um, and and I'll get back to that. But let me <laughs> let me finish these questions because otherwise, <laughs> yeah. I, my train of thought. Let me finish the train of thought here. It's tougher, Doctor Lanier. As we get older, it's tough for yeah. to stay on. I need guidance because if I would just keep talking, I go way <laughs> off the track. So. I said, well, I already have my printed question. I'm going to try to stick to that. Let me see where I was. Number five. Okay, you've been involved in, in several significant legal cases related to corporate practice, dentistry, and fee, fee splitting, so forth. Can you elaborate on these experiences and your impact on the DSO industry? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really made all the difference in the world for me beginning my career the way I told you with the 90 orthodox honest, just knocking on my door because compliance became critical to me. And it's interesting because I um, interface every day, as you know, with a lot of M&A attorneys and corporate attorneys and other folks, and none of them really had the experience I had of the 90 orthodontists on day one and all the legal actions over compliance. And everything I do, whether I'm on the buy side, the sell side, I'm representing a lender, is with an eye towards making things are compliance and making sure we can scale it up and maximize value. But a lot of the other folks, they just want to get the deal done. They, you know, they got their blinders on. We got to get the deal done. It doesn't matter. We got to get the deal done. 
And um, sometimes that's not in your best interest to get the deal done, because if you close over crazy things, your structure is wrong, your agreements are wrong, you know, the, 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 the way people are employed, the things they're doing are incorrect. There's no division between clinical and non-clinical and non-clinical is interfering with clinical. But wow, we got to get the deal done. We don't care. Let's close it. Yeah, that's a re- those things don't get better over time. They only get worse. Whatever problems you had with 10 offices, when you get 100 offices, are a lot bigger problems than they were with 10. So as a result of being involved like in these lawsuits and all those things that happened you know, back in the 90s, I am really mindful of what are the long-term implications of everything we do and making sure that whatever I create, um, Dr. Lanier, is going to be able to be scaled up without complications You know, to the greatest extent possible. I don't like, you know, buy, if I'm the buy side, I don't like buying problems. I like fixing the problems before we close. If I'm on the sell side and the buyer just wants to forge ahead, I want to make sure everything's correct, you know, and the platform looks good before I'll let my client sell into the platform. So, you know, my early history with these legal actions has really shaped you know, the way I look at these deals and transactions that has made me always think about compliance and the ability to scale up and what's this thing going to look like in five years, not, hey, let's just get the deal closed and worry about it later. Let me ask you, uh, Brian, as far as those kinds of things, and I know you you were talking about it at one of them, uh, about how to prevent, and then when, when someone's building these organizations, because I know when you're on the buy side, you have to look and you can't go in there with blinders on. And, and if you're on the sell side, you don't want to be st- stuck. So how to prevent getting in the ditch and those things you talk about at these uh, at, at these seminars that you do, how to prevent. Because I'm all about building the right kind of platform. And that's the reason right now I'm, I'm enjoying where I'm at in this space, because I have four locations that are uh, two are huge. But we're we're just building a prototype, you know, and I've seen everything has started to come together and now I could roll it out. But, I, uh, you know, the, the thing I think that is so important is getting it right from get go. And, and that way, like you said, the whole compliance structure, because everything uh, kind of operates from that center, you know, and, and if it, you get it right the way I, I, I see the DSO industry, the way it, it's done well, I guess. But I, I need to come to you and uh, again at, and see what's going on now. Recently, I've been out of the space, so just getting back in. But uh, what do you say to that? You know, my thinking on yeah. I mean, like this that. it hasn't. Some of it has changed, you know. And you and I have had conversations about that. And I know we're going to keep talking about some of the differences, but a lot of it stays the same. You got to get it right from the beginning. And you know, my hope for you, and we're certainly helping out and everything, is to make sure we get practices, you know, one through four that you have perfect and. And then you can open up a hundred. I don't know how many you, we haven't talked about it yet. And we don't know someday you'll tell your audience how many you're going to get before you're all done. But whether it's just five or a hundred, we want to have things done correctly. And we don't want to just go out and open up new offices until what we have is compliant and what we have is a proper blueprint for expansion. Too often I see people, they've got two offices say, and they're not really straightened out. There's a lot of problems in these offices and they're like, ah, we're going to open up three, four, and five, and now they got five problems. I mean, you really right. want to straighten out one and two or one, and then once you've got that perfect, then, you know, you can go open up as many as you want after that. And I think that's what you're doing right now. You personally are tremendously building a template of success. And then once you get that template right, you're going to open them all up or whatever you end up doing. Yeah. And and, and it's uh, actually it's, it's six. I, I said four, uh, there are four locations, right. six I have two uh, adult, and this is the first time I've done adult dentistry and, and multi-group practice, um, whereas mostly I concentrated on pedo uh, on, in the previous model, but it's all about building the model. And I think, you know, going in there right is just the, the right thing. I'm going to keep moving. Um, so how's your work at Dicom? Oh, oh, I think I may have asked that one. Uh, oh, could you provide some advice to dentists and dental professionals considering involvement in just getting into the space? Uh, you know, people that dental professionals, what to look for, what would you advise, and, and so forth right now? 
Well, there's a lot of opportunities. You know, the old mo- it's not what you think it is. Like, you know, if, if you're thinking about getting involved and maybe you read some books that are outdated or you talk to some older dentists or older folks, it's not what you think it is. Uh, the DSOs are, you know, if the whole industry is evolving towards DSOs, and that's an enormous amount of opportunities for dentists and non-dentists. I mean, if you are a non-dentist and you've got a really sharp mind, you know, and maybe under the old model, you might be an office manager. You know, that's the best you're going to do is, you know, you, they work for, they say you, you know, I'm working for Dr. Lanier and he really likes me and I'm his office manager. And every year or so, maybe I ask him for a little raise and, you know, that's about the best I I'm going to do. Under the DSO world that we live in now, there are tons of management positions, regional, you know, m- vice presidents, regional managers, directors over them, folks that work in the whole home office. So if you show up, even as a non-dentist, and you're really a good business person and you understand the business of dentistry, there are hundreds and hundreds of positions that have advancement that, you know, are highly compensated positions. They'll give you stock in the organization. I mean, it's just a so many opportunities right now that wouldn't have been there in the traditional dental model, you know, just the, you know, the owner associate model, the traditional, you got an owner, maybe there's an associate, it's a solo practice, you know, there's not a lot of opportunities there. Here, there's a whole world of opportunities for dentists too, you know, you can hold a bunch of positions. It's not just, hey, I'm an associate here and I'm just, you know, doing practicing dentistry, you can be a clinical director, you can be, you know, a hygiene director, you can be, you know, a liaison between the DSO and the practices, you can be a trainer, you can teach seminars and courses like you and I do. I mean, there are just so many opportunities right now in dentistry that were not there even 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah, I, I just see all upside. You, you mentioned about the um, structure. Furman, can you uh, bring that on? I wanted to just uh, show him uh, my structure here because I have a question about it. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to, okay, next slide, right there. So, and, and Brian, and this for me, I wanted to years ago. So when I built Kids Dental Care, I used this as my model and I just put the, my organizational structure as, you know, CEO and, you know, outside of, but CEO and I tried the three M's, money management and marketing. And like you said, if you go to the next one, next slide. Okay. So just like you said, there's so many opportunities like uh, chief operating officer and so forth and then operations manager, regional manager. Uh, well, we had over here and can you see my... One for legal, that's a question mark. I said, well, where where should legal go? If we're looking at uh, my model, I didn't have, I actually, we we uh, had legal pretty much under admin and AP, and we just used that as a model. But looking at that, and you, if we were to use that, where where does legal go in, in this, in, in my model? If you, yeah, you know, if you it would it would be off to the side, sort of where you have it. It would usually report up to the CF, the CEO, usually. And what you might have under legal would be compliance. HR often would be under there. Um, you know, you could possibly. Oh, I see how you have it. Yeah, it, it would be. You've got the little green thing. It would be off to the side. And yeah, I was thinking that legal. off to the side and just have. It would be a direct report to the CEO, Dr. Lanier, and then you would have under it, um, you know, usually HR would be under there. Usually general compliance would usually be under there. That's often a very common structure. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I try, I, I'm, I'm surprised sometimes when I find that doctors are trying to build something and they don't have any, any kind of structure to show their staff or their, uh, how reporting is done. And I think it, it has to be something, and I, I, I had uh, thought about it later. I said, well, legal should probably be over to the side and still have those that so could uh, take it away. And But like you said, report directly to CEO. It, it usually does, and I'll tell you why. Because in organizations, I've seen, it doesn't happen all the time. 
But but I've seen where legal's got to take a look at the finance department and make sure they're following the rules. They got to look at the marketing department, you know, and if or they got to look at the operations department where the chief operating officer is and make sure it's following the rules. And it's kind of hard, like if legal reported to the chief operating officer, how's legal going to tell everybody that the operations is not doing things correctly? But when legal reports directly to the CEO, they can tell the CEO, hey, I've looked at the finance department. They got to tweak a couple things from a regulatory standpoint. I've looked at the operations department. They got to tweak a few things. I've looked at marketing. That's why it works better if they report, you know, to the CEO versus either the CFO or the chief operating officer. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. That that, that kind of clears things in my mind because I, I, you know, the before I kind of had it over there and I, it, it would report directly to me, but I would go through sometimes admin and we work together. But I think, yeah, pulling it off to the side helps a lot. I like yeah, they got legal's got to be able to tell you, look, Dr. Lanier, you know, I'm not the the operations department is making some mistakes over here. You got to fix it. Or I looked at the advertising and marketing. I'm concerned about what's happening. And the only way that really works is if it reports directly to the CEO. If they report to one of these others, sometimes it it, it hurts their effectiveness. I love it. I love it. Let's go back to um some questions here, but uh, you know what, um, even since we have just a, a few more, uh, we have a few more minutes, I was listening to um, some of the services and things that you guys are going to be talking about at the event. And I just want to exp expose people to, because I know it was uh, a lot of different categories that they're addressing. So can you uh, just kind of go through a few of those categories and so that we can see what it's going to be about? Yeah, look, one thing that I'm really proud of, and I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to talk about it a little bit, is the most powerful three hours in the history of the DSO industry. Uh, you probably saw that on our video where we announced the agenda for our event. It's 15-minute digestible segments that cover basically my goal with this was if somebody walked in the room and they said, I'm going to create a DSO or my DSO has five offices or 50 offices and I want to know or 100 or 1,000, I want to know everything I would need to worry about everything that either will increase my EBITDA, because you know, Dr. Lanier, um, it's all EBITDA driven. It, you know, it, any type of expansion, anything you want to do in the DSO has to contribute to the growth of EBITDA or you're going to be in I trouble. One question. With now, since I, I, I was out, I came back about five years later, um, doctors were being compensated about 5% higher than it was before I left. There's a lot of costs now. And as you go, just keep that. How are, how are we going to address that? Do you just have to grow a bigger pie or, or because now you lost that percentage and now you have to have a bigger pie? But you could go ahead. But the, just, technology is the key to that, though. I, I'm going to keep going. But technology okay. is the key to how we overcome higher labor costs. It's technology and innovations. But, you know, our event's going to cover everything you'd have to worry about that could either increase your EBITDA or lower it from um, regulatory compliance, to advertising and marketing, to culture, to same store and growth, uh, to key, key performance indicators, to cyber uh, security and protection, to procurement of, you know, of inventory. I mean, lot, any possible thing that could either hurt or help your EBITDA and your organization, we're going to cover in digestible 15-minute segments. And we're going to cap it all off with uh, Steve Biltz, one of our keynote speakers on leadership from Smile Brands, right out in your neck of the woods, California. Yeah, I know, I know Steve, and I've, I've spoken to him. I, I love that guy. He's, I like. All, I mean, all you guys are heavy hitters. I, I, I just love being around and just picking up little pearls of uh, wisdom as you guys speak. So I, I, I love being around people like yeah, that. Yeah, so Steve's terrific. So, so literally, we're going to cover a 12, 15-minute segments in three hours, and nobody's ever tried this before, where we're going to go from A to Z, everything you've got to worry about with a DSO organization, and it's going to be a real powerful three hours just to start the event. Then, of course, you know, we've got keynotes from Steve Bilt, uh, Pat Bauer from Heartland's going to give a keynote, Woman in DSO. Oh is going to be there. Uh, you know, the whole industry is women. It's a majority of women. So you got to have women in DSO as a key component of it. So we're going to have that. We're going to have two really big time celebrity speakers. We're going to announce them really, really soon. And the theme is prepare to be inspired. And I want everybody to be inspired that comes there. 
Man, I, I, I want to bring my team. I really do. I want to be there for this because um, I, I, I remember years ago, I, I listened to Pat Bauer. I was just surprised at the amount of information that he just shared freely. I was thinking, you know, I was kind of expecting him to be kind of, you know, you know, he's a big, big cat out there holding things to the chest. He was just such a, a nice person just in talking about things. I was like, wow, that is right. You know, thinking, you know, so once you get a, a chance to be around people like that, you see why they were uh, in the position that they are. It's the way they think and lead. And it's just good to pick up little pearls and jewels while we're out there doing that. Well, you know, a lot of people say that the networking is the best part of the meeting. I mean, and I don't mind it. It's just I put so many hours into the content on stage. I like it when they tell me yeah, they yeah. like the content. But some people say we go just for the networking, you know, and it's the, it's the best in the industry. And like you said, most folks, you know, they're going to freely share. Dentistry is very special like that. It's not like, you know, Burger King and McDonald's or Coke and Pepsi or Pizza Hut and Papa John's where it's World War Three. It's not that way in dentistry. Yeah. There's enough to go around for everybody, and people are very generous in sharing pearls of wisdom and knowledge at these conferences. So a lot of people say um, the networking is the best part of this event. We're going to have well over 2,000 people again, and uh, it's going to be great. I love it. I, uh, You know, initially, years ago, I, was, I started networking, um, gosh, and, and at, at least... I was one of the early blacks to, to attend. And at first I was kind of nervous and I was in a kind of strange environment and I had to start meeting a few people before it's, uh, I started to kind of feel, feel relaxed and comfortable, you know, going around. But the people who I felt were the most open are the people at the top. It yeah. just seems that they, they don't have any defenses or trying, you know, it's like, I'm not competing with you at all, you know? And that kind of allowed me to uh, think, uh, okay, I'm in the right space. But uh, yeah, it, it, it took a little bit, but then if you are going to go to that next level, you have to be exposed to those kinds of people and that environment in order to move and be in the right space and, and grow. At least that's the way I see it. I, I couldn't have gone where I went unless I had been exposed to that kind of environment and it helped pull me to that next level. Yeah, I mean, it really, it's very special place, the, the dental industry. It really, really is. And our event is a lot of ways like that. You know, you'll go there and it literally, in a lot of ways, resembles, I mean, I don't know, like almost like the United Nations. There's so many countries represented and nationalities and folks there and everybody's mingling with everybody and networking. And it's just very special to watch that go on. People from different countries, different backgrounds, different cities, all getting together and exchanging changing ideas. I, I, I never, it never gets old for me. I, I really love it. Yeah. And, and, and again, like from my book, the exit, I'm just, I'm, I'm pumping my book as well, but it's a, I always think about uh, dentistry and I know I may seem, you know, to some as well, it's you're a dentist. You shouldn't be that much into the business side of it. But I think that uh, the dentist, if you build a product, you want to exit. Because sometimes you, you you know eventually that's what dentists should have in mind. Well, what, what you said earlier was I thought incredibly insightful. So I mean I want to repeat it for a second. You got to plan for the exit at the beginning. I mean there's always going to be somebody that just like you know walks up just like those ninety orthodontists showed up for me and it just happened and you didn't know. But when you're building you know a dental organization from the beginning, you really now that we know. We know what success looks like and we know what can be done. I know, Dr. Lanier, when you founded your very first dental office, you probably didn't know what's going to happen from here. I'm going to treat patients and let's just hope for the best. But now that we know the model, it's all rolling up to DSOs and dentistry is evolving. You have to be very thoughtful. And what you said a few moments ago, you know, create it with the exit in mind. And there are oh, well. actions you can take from day one that help you when the time for the exit comes. And it was one of the most insightful things you said a few minutes ago, and I just felt like it was important to repeat it. Yeah, and, and that's why I, I, I want to use you guys as part of my team. I, I, right now, I'm, uh, I'm at the second go-round. I'm building a team. I'm recruiting people. I'm actually having to pay more. So like you said, technology, I am buying some technology to help me produce more. 
But I'm going more after leaders that have already been out there, people with experience. I know to get them, I'm having to hire from other industries and they're not sitting at home, hopefully doing nothing. So now to recruit them, I got to pay them and, and actually bring in some uh, one manager on today that I have to move from another area, but I know her, her skill set. So I needed that to build my team. So I'm bringing in people and I'm just building this platform so that we can, once we got everything in place, boom, and just go like that. So I want to have all of the strategies, the legal and so forth. And it's just, Brian, I'm, uh, I'm really glad that we get a chance to actually work together, you know, on this uh, second go round. I know when I first met you, you were right about doing your exit. And I was like, this is just a really neat human being. But, you know, he's already lined up with other folks. And I, you know, you were just about done with yeah, it. Yeah, I've done it. And it was just too bad. But you did say to me the first time I met you, you said, I, I maybe we're going to find something to do someday. And here yeah, we are yeah. like 10 years later and we're, we're finally doing something. And I love building organizations. I love yeah. working with people in particular like yourself that have been successful. And now you're, you know, sort of doing it again. And, uh, yeah. you know, you need a little help, but you don't need that much help. You know, well, you know, you know and, 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 and I can tell you a quick story. I'll let you go. I when I I didn't mean to get fully back into this thing of building uh, the platform out. My ideal was do real estate, dental real estate yeah. and spend yeah. the money, build beautiful places, do, use all the demographic surveys and so forth and have them ready as a turnkey. And doctors could just walk in and take over. But I found that you can't really sell that. And EBITDA is the thing. Everybody is looking at EBITDA. And there I was with real estate, beautiful real estate. But everybody and the only doctors are saying, I want to come work for you. I was like, no, I don't want I don't want to do this again. But then I, I had to make it work. So I said, well, let me put back my thinking hat and build a team and make it work again and then explode it. And when I want to walk away, I can, or I can just let them. The, the beautiful thing is, if I could do like, uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, Rick? Uh, uh, Rick Workman from Harland. Rick Workman, and get a pat, find me a Pat Bauer. You know, I could do a uh, move on, and it could t continue to grow. If you build the right kind of platform, you bring in the right kind of people. And it'll just, I'm telling you, I see it as something, my margins may be a little bit thinner than before, but if you can just explode and just keep growing, it's just, it just keeps feeding you and feeding you and just go, and you could just sit back and say, wow, I built something and I brought the right kind of people together and it's just taking off and it just goes and just keeps growing. Dentistry to me is one of the safest bets that I, uh, because I try the stock market, I'm still getting beat down in the markets, but I know that, well, if, at least for me, this is something I know, and I'd like, you know, just learning more from you guys like yourself, so. I, I, I mean, what we it. got for you now that we probably didn't have 10 years ago, you know, before we go, is we have artificial intelligence. I mean, I remember I said innovation is the key. You know, the artificial intelligence is permeating all across dentistry from diagnostics to revenue cycle management to billing to collecting. So if we got to pay, you know, dentists a little more than we paid them the first go around with you, we can more than make up with it through innovation, through billing and collecting and revenue cycle management and diagnostics and patient finance plans. And artificial intelligence is the single biggest game changer in the dental industry that I've seen. Man, that's something I'm telling you, I'm so excited about getting back in here and making it smarter and then rather than working harder. I did. I worked hard for a long time. And I, I, um, I think the offices have to function and work hard and the whole, you know, whatever facilities, everything has to work hard. But as far as the owner, I think the main thing is is sitting there working smarter, learn as much as we can, use put together a team, and like we were saying, even like uh, for the legal, it's kind of a team outside of your your core team, but it's it's the strategy of CFO yep. the CEO is is required to have to guide us along the way. But the thing that your guys are doing now is looking at innovation and growing EBITDA. And that's what I'm looking at. I can't have my exit unless I'm looking at EBITDA. And I, I need a team that's, helped, that's focused on that, has done that, 
and knows that well. So this is just a beautiful relationship, man. Hey, I want to thank you for coming on and just doing this with, with me. Look forward to uh, getting those tickets and bringing my team on with you. Absolutely. Guys. I can't wait to see you uh, as my guest this summer. And I'm so excited to, for you and your team. And I'm sorry, you got great things coming. You got six now. If we do this show again next year, you're going to have a whole bunch more practices. And I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's going to explode. I, I love it. And I want to bring other young people along. I want to expose them to the idea of what you can have and how you can build a product. Because like you said, the the big guys out there, they, they need to consume. And in order for them to grow, so you could build a product in the middle markets and then sell it to, you know, the higher and just and then relax, do it over again if you want to, you know, work, continue to work with them or whatever. With me, you know, I'm kind of outside that. I'm an investor now and, you know, but I can see how it works. I like building platforms. I need you guys. It keeps us all young. It keeps us <laughs> yeah, all young. Yeah, it, it does. It keeps us going, man. And that's, that's one of the things I realized. I sat back for a few years and if you have nothing to do, you really start to feel like you're dying on the vine. So I, uh, I'm back at it now and I'm having fun doing what I'm doing, you know, and I've never, some of the things that I'm learning right now, I, I, I mean, I would be missing this if I was on the sideline. This yeah. is some of the best I've ever had, you know, even though we're going through this thing right now, I see that daylight. I see a little bit of daylight. So let's have fun. Thank you so much for coming on and joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Lanier. I just love being here. All right. Hey, have fun and take care of them, Ryan. Thank you. All right. All right.